Freedom in Australia is dead. Martin North, John Adams in the interest of people. Hello, John. Hello, sir. Serious conversation today. Absolutely. So we got the final report relating to the cash restriction bill. Came out late Friday. Yes. And boy, it's a doozy. So I think it's a very disappointing outcome for Australia, uh, in, in terms of in terms of the report. Um, th- there's quite a few things to have a have a chat about in today's show. Um, one's about the report. One's about the context. One's and also about what what happens when we go forward. Uh, now we did see a, a newspaper article um, uh, on Friday morning. So today is Saturday um, by the uh, by, by the by the Sydney Morning Herald, and and and, and the article was all about. Um, that the cash ban would, would basically uh, pass uh, with Labor support, and that there'd be the, there'd be no dissenting report from the ALP. Now that that's that's what we have come to learn uh, with the report coming out. Obviously, there was a dissenting report from the Greens, and we knew that the Greens had already in the last previous week said that they were against uh, against the whole bill. Mm. So now, one thing that I can reveal exclusively in this show is that um, yesterday evening I did receive a phone call from someone very senior in federal parliament. Now I won't go beyond who who this person was, but this person uh, said to me that Labor's position was effectively predetermined. So um, even though right and through this process they said well, let's look at the refund report and let's actually put up a tweet from Senator Kitching. Senator Kitching on so this senator from Victoria she was on the committee on Monday of this week that just passed she wrote and said there is no evidence to do this and yet by Friday she signs off on a report saying um, subject to a number of, of conditions so, so there's eight recommendations the first seven say do seven steps and if you do all seven then pass it so she basically signs off on this um, um, as part of this report and so I was told that that you know uh, that that for, for her to sign on she was effectively ordered to sign on to that that report even though publicly she's against it even though um, Privately, I had heard that she was against this bill. She had made valiant efforts, from what I understand, to uh, bring Labor to a different position. But the powers that be within the ALP said, no, we are going to go uh, forward, forward with this. Now, uh, uh, so the other thing I was told, and, and so, you know, it's a little bit speculation as to whether this is true or not, and we have to see, is that um, now there are a series of recommendations in the report, and they say, we want you. The committee says we want the government to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, before you pass pa, pass the uh, bill in the Senate. One of those things is to change the commencement date because the commencement date was the first of January. Um, sub, subject to that commitment that the government has already made on the commencement date, uh, we don't know if the government's going what they're going to do with the rest of the recommendations. What I've been told is is that even if they just make that one change on the on the commencement date. And they bring the bill to a vote in the Senate, even though the committee says do all, all, a whole bunch of other stuff. Labor will still vote for the bill in its current form. So that's what I've been told. Um, now, um, maybe Labor has a different point of view, um, but um, we will have to see. So, 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 yeah, I mean, we thought that Labor would actually stand up for freedom, start stand up for working people, but they have basically caved in, um, and I think it was quite disappointing. Yes. And, you know, there was always a sense, I think, along the journey that they were not clear in their own minds about what they were doing, right? And they do run scared on a lot of things, that has to be said. Um, but this is a very disappointing outcome because it also begs the question as to why have the inquiry at all if basically you just go through the motions, you basically get evidence from all sorts of people and then the final report is basically a watered down version of that evidence and a lot of things that we'll go into perhaps in a bit de- more detail were not spoken about, right? And yet what you're really saying is, well, whatever happens, they're just going to vote it in anyway. Yes, well, the politicians have to be seen to be undertaking a serious process. They have to seem to be, you know, going through some sort of deliberative, um, you know, contemplation about, about this law. And yet, from what we can tell, is that contemplation, you know, that that hasn't happened. Uh, I mean, even though we saw in in the first public hearing in December a lot of tough questions 
by Gallagher, who's no longer on the committee. And we saw some, you know, some reasonably tough questions at the hearing that I appeared, you know, I, I appeared on the 30th of January. Um, you know, Labor, f f f in terms of what I've been told, basically had a position that they were going to support. Um, and, and that basically, regardless of the evidence, that, that you know, um, they're just going to do what they're being told by whoever. So we don't know who gave the order. Was it Albanese? Was it Chalmers, the shadow treasurer, or whoever? So someone has said, no, Labor will, will, will press ahead with this. And that's why they have effectively said, pass the bill subject to, you know, a, a couple of changes here and there. And, and, and you know, the, 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 the tragedy of this, Martin, is, is that these politicians are being paid $200,000 a year. And, the, and, the, and, and, and and they're being paid to take our freedoms away where you know where the, you know we don't want our freedoms taken away and they definitely don't deserve two hundred thousand dollars a year um, and, and, it, and it just you know it just it just says something quite significant about our political system right and of course it's worth highlighting that the jail thing which is part of the bill right is more extreme than any other version of cash ban bills around the world Yes, yes. Uh, for, for the, to the best of, that I understand, in Europe, if you breach this law, you go, you you receive a fine. So we are the only country in the world that has proposed jail time um, on the table. Um, and, and basically, the, you know, there's a recommendation uh, around um, pot potentially, you know, giving some sort of exemption for first-time offenders. But they didn't take the jail component off the table, and and, and that again, it sends. A, a chilling signal around the world about what does Australia stand for. Right, and that says that neither side of politics, the two major parties, are interested in our personal freedom. Correct. Right. They're interested in a doctrinal position for no real good reason, because there's no real justification for this bill, as we proved. Well, 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 yeah, so we don't have to prove it. Yeah. The senator herself, Kitching, says on Monday there is no evidence. Yeah. So, so you know, so she's on the committee. She's looked at all the evidence. She's had closed-door conversations, and she says on Monday, no evidence. Right. And yet the machine continues just to juggernaut its way through, and uh, basically I suspect that Labor didn't want to be, um, you know, blamed for not um, supporting, uh, you know, tax reform and those sorts of things because they could see that if they started uh, going up down the track of saying, no, don't do this, then they would get some rocks thrown at the other by the other side. Well, I mean, so it's interesting you should say that. I mean, to my mind, this was a, a political winner to oppose this bill. Hmm. And, you know, one of the things I've said to a few people in politics in the last 24 hours, you know, you, you know, you know, and again, this may be controversial for some of our viewers, but, but this net zero 2050 policy that Labor has adopted and this cash ban position, uh, I mean, Labor needs to win seats in Queensland if they're going to win a federal election. They, these two positions are basically, you know, it, 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 they can't win seats in Queensland with this. So, so uh, you know, it begs the question, does Labor actually want to win a federal election or not? Because the way they're behaving, it, it, it seems that there is, you know, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. Well, they don't seem to be batting for us, so therefore yeah. they're batting against us. Absolutely. Now, before we get into the bill, so, so there's a couple of things that I just want to say to the audience. The first is, is that um, there's a whole bunch of gullible sheep out in our community about this particular issue. So, you know, so when we think about why is freedom dead, it's not just about the politicians. There's something about the Australian people themselves. So mm. I had two separate people, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, who told me point blank that they told their friends and colleagues, work colleagues, etc., about this particular law, and their friends and colleagues did not believe that this was actually real. So someone in Sydney said that one of her close friends said, quote, the government would not do this to us, therefore it can't be real. So I actually said, show them, you know, the Sydney Morning Herald article, you know, the mainstream media is openly saying this is now going to be the law. So you have that. And then I had someone in Melbourne only yesterday on the phone with me saying that of 10 people he told in his circle of influence, half of them basically said, we don't believe that this could ever be law um, uh, and that this is a conspiracy theory. So here we are, been talking about this whole issue for six months, and there are Australians today who's, who still are so asleep who think that this law um, is just make-believe. And, and I find that quite extraordinary. Yeah, and it's worth saying, John, this isn't the only piece of legislation, but if you talk about the bail-in, the deposits, all those sorts of things, right, again and again and again, people have an extreme level of faith in the government and assume that the government will always act in their interest on their behalf when in fact that's not true. 
Indeed, and, and, and on that point of faith, Martin, is, is, is this belief that our politicians are smart and they know what they're doing. <laughs> and, and that could be further from the truth. So, um, you know, one of the things I want to do now is, is that we, we had uh, a viewer from the show, uh, from this show, uh, confront Josh Freundenberg, Josh Freundenberg about a week and a half ago in Brisbane uh, when, when there was a particular event at a Brisbane pub and, and asked him point blank about uh, this particular piece of legislation, uh, and there was a follow-up around negative interest rates. So the answer from the treasurer was so bad. I mean, literally, Kath and Kim could have could have been more co- more coherent. So, but I actually want to play this for the audience just so they know how dumb our treasurer is. Just your name, suburb, and your question. Thank you very much, treasurer, for coming out tonight. We're going to speak to that committee. Um, my name is Dr. Gold Strasberg. I'm the GP of Brisbane Council. Um, I'm going to be here in the Bracken Ridge Show. My question tonight was very simple, just about the cash ban in 2019 and uh, what evidence there is that that is actually going to prevent the so-called black economy. There's been a lot of talk tonight about things that are ostensibly out of the control of the government, like the geopolitical climate and the climate of the planet. Uh, but here, you know, the local economic climate, I think introducing a, uh, a bill which uh, makes it uh, problematic to use legal tender and puts further impositions upon local businesses. Uh, is a, a big problem that the community has to be aware of. And I was just wondering, uh, from what you've uh, learned so far, what evidence there is that a cash ban bill will prevent a so-called black economy? Thank well, you. Well, this came out of, we had, as you know, we had a black economy task force which looked at these um, particular issues. Uh, and what it found is that the integrity of our tax system is very hard to trace some of those payments when people are using big lots of cash above $10,000. So it's been a black economy um, task force issue that has been looked at. Um, Obviously what's happening across our economy is there's the growing um, digital payments and transformation of people using a lot more credit cards or electronic payments um, than cash payments. And so this was really just to go to the heart of the issue of ensuring that there was um, less of a black economy and more of an economy which um, was which was um, uh, sticking to the to the right rules. Just quickly, Cheryl, I just want to go to a question over here. Um, But what about treasurer? What about the idea about um, you know that if 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 everything's done electronically through the banks? Uh, what about negative interest rates? I hear oh. people talking about negative interest rates where the banks will then charge us for keeping savings in the account. I mean, what, what is happening overseas? What is your opinion on that? And how do we know that, you know, we've, we're going to maintain rights and, and everything? So, Australia has now got a cash rate at 0.75%. That's the lowest we've ever had when it comes to our interest rates. Now, there are winners and there are losers. If you're buying your first home, and as you know, we've encouraged 10,000 first home buyers through a home loan deposit scheme to get out there in the market, and we're helping. Um, If you're borrowing money from the bank to buy a home, you like the interest rates being low. If you're somebody who saved your whole life and you're putting money in the bank, and the interest rates come down, you're getting less for it, and that makes your savings for your retirement that much more difficult. Now, so the interest rates are set by the Independent Reserve Bank. Monetary policy is set by the Reserve Bank. As the Treasurer and as the Government, we're focused on fiscal policy. They're different responsibilities. Um, But I have to say to you, a lot of countries around the world have reduced their interest rates. Um, What you refer to is called negative interest rates or un really unconventional uh, monetary policy. You see that in Japan. Negative interest rates rates, um, across some parts of the world. Um, What we uh, have is 0.75, so we're not at that point. Um, But what I do know is um, that we are focused on our part, which is the fiscal policy, and the Reserve Bank is focused on that. Well, that's astonishing, John, I must say. 
Yeah, so when I heard this for the first time, I was just flabbergasted and saying this is the treasurer of Australia and he can't explain his own policy. Um, and, 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 you know, he keeps on saying the, the Black Economy Task Force, uh, you know, said it, so therefore we must do it. Well, whoever said that the Black Economy Task Force was the virtue of all knowledge? Um, I mean, so, so if people don't realise this is a trick that's being played in Canberra and having worked for a big four accounting firm as a management consultant, um, you know, all sorts of uh, so-called credible institutions like the big four accounting firms or, a, or, or an Essentia or, or some of these other companies, they are asked to produce a report even though there is a predetermined outcome in mind and the report um, is basically used as a mechanism to justify what they want to do. Mm. And so, I, and, and having said that, I mean, I will say without saying too much, there was at least one project where I worked as a consultant where the client had a predetermined outcome. Um, uh, actually, no, sorry, two. Two projects I worked on where the client had a predetermined outcome uh, and our analysis took us in a different direction. And we were ordered by the client to rewrite the report. Now, um, that, 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 you know, in terms of what happened after that, 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 that was above my pay grade because I was only a relatively junior employee. But no, but we see this all the time in Canberra. They pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for task force and, and consultants, etc. cetera, predetermined outcome. Um, and, if it, it, and then they basically put pressure on this external party to produce the outcome and then say, well, we're not saying it. These experts over here are saying it. And this is what this task was all about. Yeah, and well, I was a management consultant for many years, and I saw precisely the same thing in the private sector as well as the public sector, I'd say, that basically management consultants are, are hired with a particular need to have a particular message that they can then take back to their board and say, those guys said, so we're going to do it. Yep. Yeah. Now, the, the other point that I look at that I think should be made is so we did say in a previous show where I had a conversation with a uh, government MP who basically voted for this bill, not knowing that they were sending people to jail. Mm. So we have seen new examples of where senators um, and, and I'll name these senators, Senators McKenzie, Senators Davey, who are both national senators, uh, one from, from New South Wales, from, one from Victoria, who in one case wrote, so Senator Davey wrote to a constituent um, and basically saying that the Black Economy Task Force consulted with, uh, well, no, sorry, they received 3,000 submissions on this particular issue, uh, overwhelming support. Well, there was no 3,000 submissions, there was 10. Mm. 10 submissions, nine in favour, and, and there was one against. Um, and, and in terms of the Black Economy Task Force, I mean, they had 144 bilateral meetings. They had nine uh, national road shows where only 300 people attended. And so, and this was not just on this particular, because there were 76 recommendations. So, so this was on all of the issues that the task force looked at. Um, and yet, you know, yet, we have senators writing to their constituents saying, 3,000 submissions, uh, overwhelming sort of support for this, uh, overwhelming evidence, um, and that could be further from the truth. And then we had um, people contacting Senator McKenzie's office in the past week where McKenzie's office is saying to people, this just affects business, this does not affect individuals, and that is actually wrong. And yet, so here's the thing, so before these politicians vote who were being paid $200,000 a year, if they had to sit an exam on this piece of legislation, I bet you not one member of parliament could actually pass it because, you know, from the treasurer on down, no one under understands what this law is, what's the intention, what's the context. And, and, and again, this is why freedom is dead. We have people in this country, in our community, too gullible and who trust the system, and we have politicians who are too stupid to know what's going on. Right, and that suggests, therefore, that there must be some mandarin somewhere inside the government machine that is actually calling the shots behind the scenes in terms of pushing this through. Indeed, indeed. And, and so, so what I was hearing during the week was that even though there was opposition uh, within the coalition from certain senators, drop this, drop this, I was told that the RBA and the Treasury told the government to hold the line, that you must press ahead. Um, and, and, and so I would say that those mandarins would be some of these bureaucrats. Right. And of course, it's um, needed because of negative interest rates, because of the enforcement of monetary policy, all those things which, because of the coronavirus, have now really come to the fore. Well, well, that, that's part of our argument, 
uh, the committee rejected that argument yep. and called it conspiracy. So, so, so let's just go to the report now. We're not going to go into the report itself into detail now. Mm. Um, the report is public; anyone can download it. Uh, you know, if people can't find a copy, contact me. Um, I'll be able to help them with that. But, but just to prove how much of a whitewash this report was. So, there's, so obviously, I, you put in a submission. I put a submission. Uh, I testified. Um, you know, we, we examined this evidence in very close detail, and and there was a number of glaring omissions in this report that I just thought was staggering. So, so I'm just going to go through a bit of a list of the things that should have been included in the report that wasn't. So, first one was um, when Flight Centre testified, they said that the the legislation was confusing because they don't know what a transaction is. For example, it's a flight. A transaction, or is it a flight and an accommodation, or is it a holiday package? And so, uh, because that that definition is unclear in the law, how do they know that they're complying with the law or not? So, so this is a fundamental issue of well, what is a transaction? Was that mentioned in the report? That was not mentioned in the report. Um, there was no reference in the report about the ten thousand threshold. Um, now, I said that there was no statistical empirical evidence to support this. Why? Because Treasury said that the task force made up the number. <laughs> um, so, and it was based on these uh, anecdotal discussions. So, th so there was no robust analysis. No, uh, did that, was, that, did that, was that mentioned in the report? That was never mentioned in, the, in, in this inquiry report. Um, and they never said, well, is 10,000 the right number? Or is there a, a different number to actually make it for, more effective? I mean, this is a central question of the entire law and that was never ever raised in the report. And again, I find that staggering. Um, in terms of tax evasion, so the Austrian National Bank, uh, and again, this was from a European policy studies report that I referenced, uh, they said they were skeptical that this could help reduce tax evasion. Um, what, was that mentioned at all? That was never mentioned. Um, in terms of money laundering, there was, there was no reference to Professor Schneider's work um, that that there is weak empirical evidence that this can actually reduce money laundering or black economy activity. And so the reason why this is important, Martin, is so you know we're supposed to do evidence-based policy. We're supposed to look at the best evidence available. Now they keep on relying on this task force, but Professor Schneider is one of the world's leading experts on the black economy. He has published at the International Monetary Fund and a whole bunch of serious publications. His analysis and his body of work was not even considered by the committee. So how can they say that this is actually going to work, even though, again, Senator Kitching on Monday says no evidence. The Senator on the committee says no evidence. And yet one of the leading experts in the world says there's no evidence that this is going to work and his work his body of work wasn't examined by the committee uh, he wasn't committed contacted by the committee his work was never referenced by the committee um uh, in in this uh, sorry like on this particular point i mean uh, he was referenced in a in, in a slightly different context about whether the black economy was growing or shrinking but in terms of does this cash payment limit work or not work he his professional opinion one of the best experts in the world was not actually included in the report. And, 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 and that says to me that these guys were not serious about investigating the best evidence available from around the world, and this was a con job. It amazes me, John, you know, standing back here, that ideas around the world, you know, best practice ideas, real insights are just thrown away as yeah. not being relevant. Somehow there's this narrow agenda and anything beyond it is just ignored. I'm just astonished by that. Absolutely. Uh, now, in terms of money laundering risk, now again, what did I say in my testimony that the OECD themselves, and this is something you mentioned in your submission, yep. that the biggest risk around money laundering was real estate with money coming from China, yep. and that the OECD had a specific recommendation about expanding the anti-money laundering framework to address this particular risk. Was that mentioned in the report? No. Did they actually reference that the Austrax said that this um, uh, law would actually imp focus on high value dealers? Was that ever mentioned in the report? It was never mentioned in the report. Now, uh, in paragraph 2.10, that the, 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 they referenced Treasury's testament. Now, Treasury said, according to the report, that uh, the, the cash payment limit or the cash transaction ban works in four countries, uh, according to these four countries, Italy, France, Greece, and Bulgaria. Now, um, in terms of the thresholds, so this, so this threshold thing is, is actually important. Mm. So we're 10,000 Australian dollars. Now, Greece is 500 euros. France is 1,000 euros. Italy is 3,000 euros. And Bulgaria is 10,000 Bulgarian, what they call lives, 
EVS, which is their currency, which is the equivalent of 5,000 euros. So, so according to these, so the Austrian says we're skeptical. This we don't think this is going to work. Treasury says four European countries says this does work, but their threshold it, it is a lot lower than our threshold. And so again, Treasury is just saying these governments says it works. Um, an independent expert investigated the claims of Italy, France, Greece, Bulgaria, and says that this is BS. That's Schneider. And, they, and, and again, they didn't actually follow the evidence trail, um, and that is just an absolute disgrace. Uh, in terms of regulatory costs, now, the explanatory memorandum says that the regulatory costs are minor. Why? Because Treasury self-certified that this would have a minor impact. Did they say? Did they actually reference that the fact that the Office of Best Practice Regulation didn't actually check the work of the Treasury to see whether this was a legitimate cost benefit exercise? No reference around that. The Law Council of Australia testified and said this was hard to get criminal prosecutions in a court of law. Was that reference in the report? No mention of that at all. Um, and, and, then, and, and then in terms of the, the material that we presented around around negative interest rates, around the elimination of cash, this IMF documentation, um, uh, was any of that mentioned at all? No, not mentioned at all. So, so, so these are some key emissions which are so critical to understanding the law itself, the, the impact of the law, the effectiveness of the law, its ability to put people into jail, and, and the context, which is this IMF context, it was all basically um, ignored by the committee. And again, how can this committee say this was an honest and legitimate investigation, Martin? Well, I th they can't. I mean, the, all those issues that you've highlighted were the critical issues, weren't they? Yes. They were the critical issues. They were the determinant issues that should have been right there in the middle of the report, fully discussed. And, you know, frankly, if you put those uh, side by side by side, it, the bill doesn't stand up. Yes, and again, Senator Kitching herself said, no evidence. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Now, so, so, so that's a bit of a high-level overview. Now, there's two paragraphs I just want to highlight for the audience because, for me, these are two of the most critical uh, paragraphs in the context of what we've been discussing. So, yep. so let me go to paragraph 2.5. The committee notes that a number of the arguments raised within these submissions were based on hypothetical scenarios such as a negative domestic interest rate environment coupled with a cashless society and future choices the parliament may or may not make, such as reducing the cash payment limit below the proposed legislated amount of $10,000. The committee considered these objections to the extent that they related to the provisions of the bill. The committee acknowledges the bill has raised concerns uh, with sections of the community. However, the committee rejects the conspiracy inherent in some of the contributions on the bill. Now, uh, we, we alleged a conspiracy. Now, there were perhaps some submissions that went beyond the c conspiracy we alleged. So we said this has nothing to do with the black economy. This is everything to do with entrapment in the banks um, and around negative interest rates. Um, now, uh, so we said this, but who else said this? The Black Economy Task Force final report. Page 48 of the Black Economy Task Force final report. This is the report that they relied the toll law on. Quote, some economists, including Ken Rogoff, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, argue that financial stability and, and effectiveness of monetary policy may also benefit. What's that in the context of the elimination of cash? Um, was there any reference to the Black Economy Task Force final report on this specific sentence in the, in the inquiry report? No, they didn't consider it. They just ignored the, the, I mean, like, I don't understand how can they, so if they say we reject the conspiracy, well, who, who alleged the conspiracy? The Black Economy yep. Task Force final report themselves. Yep. And yet, and yet they say we reject the, I mean, I mean, these guys are taking this for fools and it's so obvious. Now, um, one of the other things I just want to highlight, so, so we say there's a conspiracy. Um, the Black Economy Task Force final report says there's a linkage between the elimination of cash and negative interest rates. Now, in the last 48 hours, so there's a famous, American investor called Doug Casey. Um, he he was very famous in the 1970s, um, and, and he has a newsletter. He's been you know he, he's sort of in his 60s and 70s now, but uh, and, and and he's extremely wealthy. So he's made a lot of money through investing. He's been very influential, particularly in the United States. He issued a newsletter. Uh, so so and an American actually, who's a friend of mine, sent this newsletter to me, where he said that this law 
as in Australia, this cash payment limit law in Australia, and he mentions this Australia, and he's very knowledgeable about this bill. He says this is all about entrapment in the banks. So, um, so again, you know, this guy is a super smart guy, super rich, uh, way way more intelligent than anyone on this committee, and he knows what's going on. And, and he he basically says exactly what we say now. Um, uh, so I've shared this uh, uh, newsletter with you. Yep. Uh, I said it to you this morning. Yep. Um, if anyone wants a copy of this Doug Casey um, newsletter, send me an email. Let's put our, my w- email on the screen um, for people to, to know my email. Email me whenever you want. I will share this with you. But Doug Casey from the United States says that this is entrapment by the banks. Now, someone else in the last 24 hours also said this is about bank entrapment. Now, uh, Cora Bernardi was a senator for many years in the Senate, first as a liberal, then as an Australian conservative. He finished off as an independent when the Australian conservatives wrapped up. He was on 2GB uh, yesterday on Friday uh, with Ben Fordham and said that this is about entrapment in the bank. So let's actually play former Senator Cora Bernardi saying the same point we make. Now, there is a former independent senator slamming a proposed government bill to outlaw cash payments of more than $10,000. And I can tell you, he's not alone. The bill, which is expected to pass federal parliament with Labor's support, would ban payments over ten grand and comes with a potential two-year jail sentence. The aim is to crack down on criminals laundering money. But at the end of the day, it will affect law-abiding citizens too. It's another example of people telling you what to do with your money. And Corey Bernardi, the former independent senator and former leader of the Australian Conservatives Party, joins me on the line. Corey, g'day, mate. How are you, Ben? I thought it was our money. Well, it is our money. And what concerns me about this, Ben, is the complete lack of privacy that will result. Governments will be able to track every transaction that you make and that has far-reaching potential consequences, not least of all for our health care or our, our insurance purposes or just maintaining a bit of dignity about what you're spending your own cash on. You don't want them to know it. Mate, they take enough of our cash already through tax. That's the thing that really annoys me. It's not like they don't have their hands on enough of our cash and they want to get you know, their eyes at least or their fingerprints on the rest of the stuff that we get to keep. Well, governments claim they never have enough money and people are always paying, uh, underpaying their share. But the truth is they've got plenty of cash. But what they want to do, Ben, is they want to be able to make sure that no one can opt out of the banking system. And so they, they could have bank bail-ins if there's a problem with that. They can say, hang on a second, you're spending too much at your local Dan Murphy's. Uh, we're going to put your health care premiums up. This is the implications of a purely digital world. Privacy, as we know, will disappear. It's hardly the kind of policy that most Liberal voters would endorse, don't you agree? Well, that's right, and it surprised me when it was proposed. I remember uh, when it was first initiated, Kelly O'Dwyer, who was the minister at the time, said that it should be lower and made it go down to $2,000 or $1,000. Now, we know there are some exemptions in it, but it's still a step in the wrong direction. Governments have enough money, we need our privacy, and I think this is an ill-conceived decision. How are you enjoying semi-retirement? Mate, it is the greatest uh, decision that I've made in the last 10 years, I suspect. Next time you're in town, drop in and we'll say good day, Corey. Thanks for jumping on the line. You're always welcome, Ben. Thanks. Good on you, mate. Former Liberal Senator, former Conservative Party Senator, former Independent Senator, Corey Bernardi. They take enough of our money as it is through taxation. Now the little bit that we get to keep, they want to say on how we spend it. What do you make of that? 131873, the open line number. Well, there you go. Straight down the line. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so yeah. So, so when we consider these international vo- so when we consider former members of the Senate, international wealthy smart investors, saying the same thing we're saying, um, it, it beggars belief that 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 the the that the um, uh, that the committee says we we reject any conspiracy inherent in the bill. Now, the other the other thing that the committee said in this paragraph two point five was. The, a number of the objections were based on quite hypothetical scenarios. Now, uh, the, the reality is is that if, so, so here's the thing, if you pass the bill and then negative interest rates 
actually comes into being. So it's no longer hypothetical, it's real. And people are actually trapped in the banking system because of this law. Well, is Parliament gonna make any changes then? I mean, the purpose of these inquiries is to consider this bill not only in the current environment, but in possible future environments and how will this law actually uh, evolve. And so I would have thought, and, and having been a policy advisor for a senator, um, we would consider uh, when we worked on deregulation policy, we would consider hypothetical scenarios. Mm. If this happened, what would this happen? Uh, this is something I've done as a public servant, as a management consultant. And I'm sure as a management consultant, you've done Absolutely. policy work on yep. hypothetical scenarios. Mm. So um, the fact that we propose a hypothetical, because we don't have negative interest rates today. So the fact that we propose a hypothetical scenario and we said that this law will have significant consequences in that scenario, well, why can't the committee test that number one and number two is is that when negative interest rates does come in will the will the parliament do anything about this law if people are adversely affected by this law when negative when interest rates are negative no they won't and, and and so so this is my allegation that this law is about um setting up a framework before negative interest rates come in so when negative interest rates do happen then then, then the government and the banks have more control. And this is exactly what Doug Casey says, what Cora Bernardi says. And, and so, uh, again, I just find this remarkable that you're not allowed to consider hypothetical scenarios. And even though the Black Economy Task Force final report makes a linkage between this and negative interest rates and cash, um, the conspiracy cannot be considered. Um, and I just, look, I don't understand how people can write, the, write this garbage with a straight face. No, and it's again worth saying, you know, in the last couple of weeks, the global and local economies are all looking a little bit wobbly because of the virus. And that is likely to lead to lower interest rates, quantitative easing, and all of the things that were hypothetical could well become reality and much sooner than people think. Indeed, indeed. So, so today, Saturday, the RBA board is meeting on Tuesday. So uh, Christopher Joy from the AFR is forecasting definitely a quarter point cut. Um, he says there could even be a 50 basis point cut, which means, so the RBA said last year that once we hit 0.25, that's when QE will start. And, and yet we could, we could be at 0.25 in, in three days time. Um, and again, this is a so-called hypothetical scenario. Well, I mean, again, I just find that quite extraordinary that, that, that they would go there. Now, the other thing that I just want to raise, uh, because again, I just find this extraordinary, is paragraph 2.7. The committee also notes that contrary to evidence provided to it, the cash payment limit does not in any way reduce the capacity of individuals and businesses to withdraw money in any denomination from their bank accounts and hold it outside the financial system. Likewise, the bill does not affect the ability to deposit cash with a financial institution. Now, the key th issue on, on this, Martin, is, is that, so when we said that this would trap people in the bank, so again, if you wanna do a, a transaction above $10,000, you have to use the banks. And, and the politicians openly say this, you can hold cash, but if you wanna do that transaction, go to the banks, use the banking system. Now. One of the things I said, so, so when they said contrary to the evidence provided to it, now who provided that evidence? That's me. So what did I say in my testimony? I said that um, the bill itself um, makes all transactions illegal. Yep. But then there's section eight of the rules, which says that if you are an a AML CTF uh, entity, um, um, basically if you report to Austrac for cash transactions above 10,000, um, you are exempt from the law. So who does this cover? This covers the banks. Now. Uh, so, so, so without going into the specific provision of it, well, let's put Section 8 of the rules on, on the screen. So what I said was that this is an exemption to this cash ban, hmm. cash transaction ban. If you repeal Section 8, what that means is it is illegal to withdraw money from the bank because, because, because this is the exemption. Now, they say they reject that evidence. Now, my question is, is that if, if you pass the bill, and you pass the regulation, and then a, a, the assistant treasurer removes section eight, what is the legal effect? They never answer that question. Mm. And so if they were to answer that question, they would show that what they said in this paragraph 2.7 is completely bogus. Because again, if you remove 2.7, the banks basically cannot engage in transactions above 10,000, which means deposits and withdrawals. So again, if I'm wrong, and, and, and I've actually asked a legal uh, a lawyer to, to see if they can produce a legal opinion on this particular point. But if this all became law and you repealed Section 8, 
what would happen, what's the legal effect. Uh, my reading is this impacts your ability to withdraw money out of the banking system. Uh, what's your view, Martin? Well, the Section 8 thing, so that is not in the bill, that's in the regulation, isn't it? That's right. Right. And the regulation can be changed without coming back to Parliament. Yes. It can be changed essentially at stroke of a pen. Yes. If that was changed, if it was removed, I agree with you. My interpretation would be that you would not be able to pull out more than $10,000 or put more than $10,000 into the bank. Correct. Yep. Correct. So, 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 so yet, and yet the committee says they reject that, hmm. and yet they won't answer the question. If you repeal Section 8, what happens? Well, we know what happens. And again, I mean, this particular paragraph is so wrong. Uh, and again, you know, we have seen politicians voting for law, not knowing about jail. They have told their constituents a range of things about this that they have no idea about. And yet they put something in the paragraph, in, in, in this paragraph 2.7, which is categorically wrong. And again, I reject this and we'll, we'll get a legal opinion and we'll present it on the show. Uh, because these politicians have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. So, so now, uh, l l let's go to the recommendations. So, um, again, so what did I say at the beginning of the show? That lay, for, for what we know, the government has, has agreed already to changing the commencement date. Now, the, the committee has asked for the commencement date to be the 1st of January 2021, which means there would be no uh, cash transaction ban throughout this year. Now, we don't know if the government's going to agree to that specific date, but we know it's not going to be retrospective. So there has to be some sort of future date. But basically, um, the committee has asked for a few things. One is they want the government to assess, is this cash payment limit the most effective way to deal with the black economy? Now, this is a bogus recommendation because what's the government going to say? Well, we already did the review. Hmm. The black economy task force said this is the most effective way. So um, the, if the committee is asking for a new review, to look at this, um, I don't think, now the government could agree to it. I don't think the g government uh, will agree to it. But again, my mail is, is that if they do no new review, Labour still will vote, vote for the bill. Uh, then they have an issue of uh, the government needs to address this issue of debanking and the lack, and the lack of banking services in regional rural Australia. Well, well so, so when they say that you have to respond to these concerns, well, the government can't actually mandate um, you know, the banks to do certain things uh, because it carries a commercial cost on the banks. Um, um, and, and basically, you know, the government's not actually involved in that. So um, I don't think the government's going to actually ad address these concerns in any meaningful way. Now, if, the, if Labor says, well, without these changes, we're not going to pass it, that's one thing. But again, my information is, is that uh, no matter what the government does on debanking or uh, access to banking services in regional rural Australia, they're going to vote for it. Now, this issue of the impact of migrant communities, um, so obviously this is coming back to the funeral issue about certain ethnic communities like to pay for funerals in cash, and so they say, well, let's actually review the impact on migrant communities. Well, what about reviewing the impact on white people? I mean, I mean, look, I just find this, you know, this this race segregation about let's actually look at a subsection of the population, and and you know, and again, so here's here's the thing, here's the dilemma that the committee really hasn't resolved is, what if migrant communities um, are disproportionately affected by this bill because they use more cash than white people? Um, so what? I mean, what is, what's the government supposed to do with that? Well, isn't the other point, John, aren't you going to be getting into race discrimination issues here? If, well, if you basically say there's one set of rules for those people, there's one set of rules for those people, you've created race discrimination. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, uh, so, so, so yeah, so, I mean, uh, I don't understand why they've said do a review about migrant communities no. because, so, so just say there was an impact. <laughs> um, I mean, we all suck it up or we all free. I mean, like, it's got to be one or the other. Now, the, the, other, the other thing is, is that, so, so on this issue of the exemptions, now, uh, they have asked for just one exemption to be moved from the regulation to the, to the bill. And this is the exemption about private transactions. So they're basically saying that, um, so, so remember, private transactions under this exemption is still okay, that in you and I can do a private individual to individual deal, and that's legal. So they're saying put that in the bill so that if you ever wanted to change that, um, you need a new process of parliament, but 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 so and that's important. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll give a tick on that mm. one. But um, again, section eight, which is the entrapment in the banks, um, that they didn't say anything about moving that exemption into the bill, um, and that speaks volumes to me. Yeah, well, that's where the real linchpin point is, as we said earlier on. Yeah. John, I have one question: Who do you think wrote this report? 
Well, um, so so the report would have been written by the parliamentary staff. So so the committee, so the Senate Economics Committee have its own um, uh, staff, uh, the secretariat. So so they're uh, responsible for uh, 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 organising submissions, um, putting public hearings on, writing reports, um, and, and working with the committee um, to actually come up with the final report. So so yeah. So here's the thing. So I think that the chair. Would have guided the staff, uh, and, and, and so Mark Fitt, who was the secretary, was the sec- he's the secretary of the of the committee. That they would have had some guidance process, but this was the committee report was written by bureaucrats. Mm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the politicians can't actually pull their pen out and say, "Hey, we want a substantial rewrite of this bill," or, or in terms of this report, or you know, or, or we don't like how you wrote this report. We're going to have a dissenting report or an alternative opinion. So politicians have enormous capacity to change language in a report to to actually dissent from the report but but the but labor in particular didn't do that and, and central alliance actually didn't write a dissenting report as well so it's interesting to know what dissenting central alliance's view of this report is um given that that this is this report's an abomination right so what you're saying is if they'd wanted to do something they could have absolutely right so the fact they didn't speaks volumes agreed yeah so where does that take us, Joe? So, so where does this take us is, is that so the next step in this process is we need to wait f- for a response from the government. So the government now has to respond to this report. So uh, of these, so there's eight, eight recommendations. The, the first seven is say do something. And recommendation eight says if you do all seven, then pass the bill. Now, um, how many, so we know that the government is going to do one of them, which is change the commencement date. So we know that. Of the others, we need to wait to see what Suka and Frydenberg and Morrison say. Um, and depending on what they say, um, you know, again, Labor, Albanese's office yesterday said that, you know, they haven't come to a final position. Uh, people on the phone are saying something very different to me. But um, now, uh, if 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 people do want to wish, to, you know, I, I think people should, I think people should do a couple of things. I think that people should absolutely uh, call the coalition and Labour and say you betrayed us, um, you know, you didn't actually do this properly, um, we don't accept this law, we don't accept your evidence, and if you vote for this, we're not going to vote for you at the next election. And, and I think, you know, that's one of the key takeaways that, that has to happen, even though, and I, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, so in my early 20s, I used to be in the ALP. So I used to be a <laughs> yes. member of the ALP when I was very, very young. Then I joined the Liberals, and I was with the Liberals for about 15 years, uh, worked for the Liberals in, in Parliament, but, but if this is the course of action they're going to take, um, in, in terms of my mind, I mean, we, we basically have to reject th- this, this two-party cartel and actually go to something else um, to actually, you know, have an agenda that's actually going to stand up for, you know, for, for our rights and our, and our freedom, particularly as we go through a, a significant economic crisis. So, uh, so once we hear from the government, you know, the government, if they just change the commencement date, that they could easily come back with a vote in about three or four weeks' time, or if they say we're going to substantially make some revisions to the bill, or we're actually going to conduct a review, this is going to push it out maybe three six months. But but I think on the basis of this report, I think unfortunately it looks like this law, in one form or another, will become law. Um, and 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 I think this is a terrible signal that Australia has sent the world. Well, it's a betrayal, isn't it? It's a betrayal of trust. It's a betrayal of personal freedom. And basically, it's a really um, eye-opening understanding of what really goes on behind the scenes in politics. Absolutely. Which is messy and not in our interests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things, yes. So, so we've seen uh, a whole bunch of, of people who are overpaid, uh, who, who don't read the laws they pass, uh, who don't understand the issues I- involved, um, and basically, who do behind the behind the scenes deals that basically um, try to uh, take away our freedom, try to um, entrap us into uh, corrupt systems like the banks, um, and, and all we want is the freedom to determine our own economic affairs. Um, and, and, and because on this issue, the, the report says, well, this issue of freedom of privacy has to be balanced against the black economy um, and the money laundering um, and, and the tax evasion aspect. Um, and again, the evidence does not show that this cash payment limit at $10,000 is actually going to make one iota difference to these two issues, and the government can't produce any evidence. And again, 
Labour's own senator said there is no evidence for this. So, so on what basis do they proceed? Um, it seems pretty corrupt to me. Yeah, well, I would say, John, that the interests of the people just got up a notch. We're going to have to push harder and broader to continue to make these things more transparent and perhaps wrought change. But it's not going to be an easy journey, is it? No. Martin North, John Adams' interests of the people? We'll see you next time.